Okay, so um, today we are basically going to be doing a talk through of scene three of Streetcar Named Desire, okay? And this is a really, really important scene for the play because basically the actions in this scene direct the course of the rest of the play. And so it's really, really key in terms of establishing the coarseness, I suppose, and the rowdiness and the, um, the roughness of New Orleans life in the way that Stanley and Stella and Blanche now are gonna be living it. And um, basically it revolves around this idea of a poker game. And it is interesting because as we said before, the poker game, the poker night, sorry, was one of the working titles that Williams had for the play originally. And so obviously this is something that for him when he was writing this was a really kind of key pivotal point in the play. Um, we have foreshadowing of violence and then we have the violence itself. We have Mitch and Blanche meeting each other for the first time and we see how Blanche actually shifts into gear um, in this scene as well in terms of when she feels that she has somebody that she can, I suppose, use. And, and there is a sort of parallel with Stanley to that degree, isn't it? We saw, we saw Stanley in scene two before um, the way that he f zones in, he focuses in on something that could be useful for him when, or, or, or something that he feels that he's entitled to with regard to Belrev and the loss of Belrev. And here we have Blanche doing something quite similar, which is zoning in on Mitch immediately. So both of them, to a certain degree, are quite pred predatory, as predatory as each other, aren't they? Which is quite an interesting parallel. Um, but that comes out in this scene. We have um, Stanley whacking Stella's thigh, which foreshadows what happens a little bit later on. And we see a little bit more about their dynamic. Um, we have this um, kind of very, very clear way that Blanche misrepresents herself in terms of interpreting her own name um, and outright lying in terms of her, her past and actually her own um, relationship with Stella. She says that she is the younger sister, which clearly isn't true. Um, and so her, we, we see her lying actually beginning to border on pathological. And we also have this idea of... Um, the attraction between Stella and Stanley as well. Um, you know, he's shouting at her with heaven splitting violence. So this is a really key scene. It also brings out this idea of light and the way that light is used with, in, in terms of um, Blanche. And what is, she asks, um, she asks Mitch to cover the light. Um, and we also have her need to be reassured um, which again is sort of representative of this, this need to be relevant, this need to be recognized, which is not to take away from the human side of her story, uh, also quite representative of this idea of the old South somehow dying away and being irrelevant or unseen or not, not important. And so we've got a, that sort of metaphorical dying away as well, which is really interesting. Um, we can also see that there are some developments in the way that Stanley and Blanche relate to each other. You can see that Stanley actually is a little bit jealous of the way that Mitch responds to her and the way that she responds to Mitch. So even though he's stating outright that he doesn't like her particularly, that he's got no time for her, he also doesn't want anyone else to have her, uh, in inverted commas. And so um, this also foreshadows a little bit what happens towards the end of the play in terms of the fact that if he can't have her emotionally, he will have her physically, whatever that, whatever that takes. So this is a really key scene. Um, so I'm just going to start at the beginning and I'm just going to go through and it's a talk through really uh, in terms of comments, thoughts, connections that, that I make. It, it's not going to include everything. You're going to make other connections as well. But um, this is just my response. So the first thing I want to think about is the stage directions. And it's really clear when Williams is describing the scene here. We have um, a picture of Van Gogh of a billiard, a billiard parlor at night. And again, we have this, this combination of high and low art, don't we? We have this sort of life as art, very brutal, very rough, and then contrast with, contrasted with Van Gogh, this sort of um, picture. And obviously it's not the real original. And so there's this idea of artifice and illusion and um, aspiration as well, embedded inside of there. So we have these two clashing realities, the sort of the aspirational of the, of, of this new sort of class of people with opportunity that would never have been there before. But there's also something quite sad about it, that contrast, that juxtaposition is quite sort of pathetic as well, isn't it? Um, we have the poker players and they're wearing colored shirts, solid blues, purple, they're all primary colors. And so Williams is definitely creating this as a, as a very sort of um, 
uncomplicated, I suppose, group of people. You know, they're wearing solid colors, they're earthy, they're um, uncomplicated, unpretentious. They say what they think, they, um, you know, they, they're very direct and there's none of the sort of courtesies that are the, the driver or the, the, the linchpin of the way that Blanche and Stella really communicate. And so this, this um, is quite stereotypical, isn't it? It's a stereotypical alpha male. They're drinking whiskey. You know, they're not drinking partial fancy cocktails of any kind. Anything that could even be slightly considered girly um, isn't there. We've got dim light. And again, we have this idea of light being, being interesting in this scene. And so Steve starts off, anything wild in this deal? And you can see that the dialogue is very snappy, isn't it? They're only saying what they have to say, no more, no less. And it's very direct, it's very functional, it's very stereotypically um, male, I suppose, is, is what Williams is trying to do here. Um, we may like that, we may not like that, we may agree with the fact that that's a stereotype or not, but, but I suppose when this was written, that, that could have been what he was trying to portray. Um, we also have swearing, we have vulgarity, we have get your ass off the table, Mitch. Nothing belongs on a poker table but cards, chips and whiskey. It's very stereotypical alpha male, isn't it? Um, and then Mitch actually responds to him. And this is interesting because Mitch says, kind of on your high horse, ain't you? And so you can see from this that, that Stanley does have a negative impact on the people around him and that even the men around him may not respond particularly positively to it. They, they might resent it as well. And so this shows us that Mitch may be slightly different, although he's trying to fit into this particular circle. Um, and then Mitch says, I got a sick mother. She don't go to sleep until I come in at night. And this foreshadows to a certain degree the sort of the connection, the hook that um, Mitch will have for Blanche because they have that in their past, don't they? This idea of a sick, sick parent. And Blanche spoke about this in scene one when she um, was telling Stella about the loss of, of, the, of, of Belle Rev where she said um, this parade of death. And so Mitch is kind of involved in that as well. Um, and then we move on a little bit and Stanley's language is very imperative, isn't it? He's impatient, he's commanding and he's very much in control of the situation. And it may be that others don't like it, but he is in control. Deal, he says. Um, Shut up, deal, one. It's all very limited, it's very um, snappy and very imperative. And so again, this tells us quite a lot about Stanley, not just in, in his approach to other people, but just his expectations that he will be in control of his environment. And that might explain a little bit why Blanche irritates him so much, because she is something that he cannot control. Um, and so, uh, then we have this kind of interesting cut where the women come in. And if we go back to the end of scene two, we have this very sort of female conversation between Stella and Blanche where they're talking about Belle Rev. And so the end of scene two is Stella and Blanche. And then the beginning of scene three goes straight into this male poker night. And again, this is part of Williams talking, um, the way that Williams has structured the play. End of scene one, we have Blanche like this. There's quite dramatic endings and quite a lot of contrast between scenes. So in terms of the way that this has been designed um, to keep us interested, I suppose, um, that's part of the, the way that it's been constructed because obviously uh, the action takes place in a very small space, doesn't it? As we talked about in terms of unities of place. And in order to keep it interesting, I suppose Williams has to have these, these transitions, these, these brisk changes between the masculine, the feminine, the dramatic, the, the, the low key, just, just to keep us on the edge of our seats, I suppose, to keep us moving. Um, and so then after Steve, we have Stella and Blanche coming in and Stella um, mentions the game is still going on. She's obviously a bit nervous about Blanche moving into this and sort of the clash of worlds, I suppose. And Blanche goes back to her default position, which is, how do I look? Do I look done in? And Stella goes back to the script, which is, no, you're as fresh as a daisy. But what's interesting is that even though Stella is, um, Blanche is fishing for compliments, she then rejects them. And so you can see her hunger there. She says, do I look done in? Stella says, no, you're as fresh as a daisy. 
And Blanche says, one that's been picked a few days. So even though Stella is telling her what, what she wants to hear, it's still not enough for her. She has this need, this hunger that comes through even in these little interchanges with her sister. Um, and so um, we move on. Blanche comes in and again, she goes back to this default position with Stanley and she says, please don't get up. And Stanley says, we weren't going to, don't worry. And so he's deliberately trying to um, frustrate, frustrate that, that need that she has. And it's interesting because he sees what she needs and deliberately goes against it, which again is part of his, his own pathology, I suppose, his own sort of abusive pathology, but also um, shows a certain intelligence, doesn't it? An intelligence, identifying what people need from him and just rejecting it, not caring his comfort is his primary driver. And so Blanche continues with this and poker is so fascinating. Can I kibbutz? I, I, I'm pretty sure she doesn't find poker fascinating. It's all part of her artifice and this, this need to be charming and attractive and the need to be perceived as being charming and attractive. Um, Stella comes in and then Stanley whacks her on her thigh too hard. Um, and so this definitely shows us that Stanley not only doesn't care what other people think, that he's a creature of impulse as well. He sees something and he goes for it, he gets it. And, um, and then Blanche responds with, you know, I think I'll have a bath, I think I'll bathe, um, I'll retreat. And the part of this is because the scene is too real for her, she can't quite cope with it. And so again, we're going back into this idea of washing herself, too close to the, the sort of the, the, not the dirt, but the grit of reality. And so she retreats back into her bath. Um, my nerves are in knots. Is the bathroom occupied? She knocks, Mitch comes out, and then we have that moment where they see each other. And to a certain degree, she sees what she needs from him in her, you know, in his eyes. She hasn't gotten it from Stanley, and so she sees Mitch. And it, again, there is something quite predatory in the fact that she recognizes very quickly that here is somebody that might be able to give her what she wants. And it might be that look of surprise when he sees her and thinks, oh gosh, that look, she recognizes it very easily in the same way that Stanley recognizes vulnerability when he sees it. And so we have this interchange where she, Stella asks Mitch about, her, um, about his mother. And obviously Blanche recognizes that he's obviously um, in a situation that she may have, you know, she's been in in the past. And so that there might be a way of kind of connecting with him there. But I think that that first connection is when they see each other and she recognizes that in his eyes, that, that his surprise, his attraction, his admiration, his recognition that she is a woman that probably doesn't belong in that particular, particular environment. And so that's really, I think, what she's looking for. But Blanche recognizes this and says, that one seems superior to the others. There's nothing actually about him that does seem superior, apart from the fact that he has recognized her. And so there's that sort of reflection. And so she's projecting onto him values that she doesn't actually have any basis for, based purely on the fact that he has responded to her. And so that's quite an interesting little self-fulfilling prophecy isn't it self-fulfilling cycle and she says i thought he had a sort of sensitive look which really just means i could see that he was attracted to me i think um and again this interchange between blanche and stella we have this dialogue which is very short and it's quite similar to the dialogue at the beginning with the men when the men were just literally bang 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 exchange very practical exchange of information very functional and now that Blanche has recognized something that she wants she switches into this sort of dialogue as well where it's very short lines he seems superior yes he is I thought he had a sensitive look his mother is sick is he married no is he a wolf why Blanche and so this idea of having very short focused fact-finding dialogue is quite similar and quite parallel to the way that the men were speaking to each other at the, at the beginning. And it's not that typical, really, of Blanche, is it? Blanche tends to be quite flowery and quite 
um, sort of airy in the way that she uses language. And there's nothing really articulate about that. It's entirely functional because she's recognized that there's something that she needs. Um, you know, and she finds out what he does um, and finds, you know, tries to project onto him a sort of glamour or sort of sensitivity or romance that there's no justification for. Um, and then she insults Stanley um, because she says that um, she thinks that Mitch is probably quite important. And Stella turns around and says, no, actually, Stanley's the only person that's actually going to go anywhere. And, um, and that doesn't play along with Blanche's script in her head, this romance she's creating in her head already ahead of herself. Um, and then she insults Stanley. I haven't noticed the stamp of genius on Stanley's forehead. So again, she's projecting this need onto others. And when she doesn't, when other people don't play along with it, she'll then insult them, which is what she's done in that particular little bit. And then we move on to this idea of the light. And we can see that she is standing in the light. And it's, it comes right after this dialogue where she's been pretty clear about what she wants from Mitch, why she wants to find out about him. She wants something from him. She wants his adoration, admiration, love, um, and she doesn't know him. And so at that moment in time, Williams positions her standing right in the light. And so we can see as an audience, that is Blanche naked. That is Blanche revealed. That's what she wants. Um, and Stella responds and says, you're standing in the light, Blanche. And then Blanche moves out of it with, um, removes her dress and puts on a kimono. And again, the sort of idea of the exotic or the out of place and the inappropriate is here. And again, it's becoming, it's verging on pathological, isn't it? This inability to recognize what's appropriate in her surroundings. But that idea, we've seen her as, you know, as an audience in the light when she's constantly trying to get away from it. And so we can see that that's actually Williams, I think, telling us this is what Blanche is. You know, she, she too is quite narcissistic. She too is quite predatory in the sense that she recognizes what she needs in people and will go for it directly. Um, and then she moves on to insult the wives. Um, and again, this is Blanche reveal to a certain degree, isn't it? Um, okay, um, then Blanche is aware, you know, that, that Mitch is sort of distracted, I would say. And she puts the rumba music, well, the, the rumba music comes onto the radio and the rumba is the dance of love and sensuality and sophistication. And she begins to move her arms and stretch indolently like a cat. This is because she knows that she has an audience. She's now in the streak of light. She wants people to see her. She wants people to notice her, but not the true her, but her sexuality and her, her, her sexuality, but at the same time, inaccessibility, which again is, is uh, a little hypocritical, um, especially with the rumba playing. And then again, we have a moment of violence from Stanley where he asks them to turn it off, tells them to turn it off. And when they don't, he grabs the radio, turns it off and Blanche challenges him. That look without flinching, there's a direct challenge in there. And he's obviously really annoyed because he's not winning. Um, we have Stanley criticizing Mitch because Mitch isn't cooperating with the game. And so Stanley is annoyed because he wasn't listening. Mitch wasn't listening. And he, Stanley says he was looking through the, them drapes. And again, we have a moment of violence where he jumps up and jerks roughly at the curtains. This is unnecessary sort of aggression. And this is stemming exactly directly from his impulsiveness which Williams paints as being directly connected to his sort of alpha masculinity and his, his um, his go-getting class struggle as well. So those things are all going to be connected together, I think, here. Um, Stanley starts yelling, sit down. And then Blanche moves in again softly. We have Stanley yelling, Blanche softly. And again, we have this idea of contrast. Um, and she says, hello, the little boy's room is busy right now. This is the second time that she's tried to infantilize men in order, I suppose, to control them. 
and um, that's that's a, a sort of a, a thing that she did. I think it was scene one or two. I can't remember. Um, I think it was scene two when she was talking to Stanley about the the loss of Bel Rev. She calls him a. She, she says something like, um, "What's going on in that little boy's head of yours?" This idea of her needing men, but also trying to infantilize them in order to control them. That comes up again here. And um, and again, she's playing the coquette, isn't she? She said, oh, I hate beer. And then she slips on a dark red satin wrapper. Blanche and her clothes and the color signals that she sends are quite powerful, aren't they? You know, at the beginning of the play, she's wearing white. Here she slips on her dark red wrapper because she's in planned seduction. So in the same way that the colors that the men are wearing are not subtle. It's not a subtle message. This is also not a subtle message. You know, she's wearing her dark red satin sexual um, robe. And then we have this conversation between Mitch and Blanche. And again, she recognizes that on, on the case, there's a poem by Mrs. Browning. And she sees this almost as a sign that he is a man about, you know, a man who is different to others. And actually, again, this is her projecting, isn't it? She perceives this as being romantic and sorrowful. And this means that he's not in fact inappropriate for her, that he is in fact appropriate for her, which really isn't, isn't the case, is it? Um, so, you know, she, she again projects this romanticizing him and romanticizing everything, you know, sorrow makes for sincerity, I think. And again, that's really a romanticized view, isn't it? In the same way that there's a lot of romanticizing about the old South that, that I think was in the video yesterday. This need to romanticize, to, to kind of create an illusion, to cover things with a Chinese paper lantern so that the reality of it isn't too upsetting for people. And so, you know, really, it's a coincidence that this case has a poem on it. And, you know, but she's transforming that into being representative of Mitch and his character and the fact that he will be able to fulfill her needs. Um, and then she moves down and obviously she's she's had a, a beer or two, I think. And she says, um, oh, my tongue is a little thick. You boys are responsible for it. And that's interesting, that's Blanche, isn't it? Everybody else is responsible for things. In order to sustain her illusion about who she is, she needs to create that responsibility and also project that responsibility onto other people for her. Um, she's always been dependent, supposedly, on the kindness of strangers. Uh, she projects needs onto them. She makes them responsible for helping her sustain her paradigm of class and gender and relationships and love. And when they don't cooperate, that's when she needs to retreat back into her own head and have a bath or something like that. Um, she moves on and she explains her name to Mitch and she says, Dubois, it's a French name. It means woods and Blanche means white. So the two together mean white woods. She is wearing her red satin wrapper at this point in time. And she says, like an orchard in spring, you can remember it by that. And actually, White woods doesn't sound very much like an orchard in spring, does it? It sounds like old. <laughs> White woods, um, you know, maybe covered in snow, maybe the leaves are falling off the trees, you know. So the idea of white woods doesn't necessarily mean young and virginal. It could also mean aging and, and, and moving closer to death. And, but she represents this as an orchard in spring. And this is really key to her misrepres misrepresentation of herself. Um, he says, you're French. We are French by extraction. The pretension of that is something that for Stanley would be, it would, would enrage him. But Mitch seems to respond to that. And so what she's doing is almost testing him out to see if he'll respond to her script in the way that he's supposed to respond to it in the way that Stanley doesn't respond to it. And step by step, he sort of passes the test, doesn't he? He's impressed by the orchard in spring. He's impressed by the French extraction. Uh, and then she continues, and this is where her lying is, is quite pathological. Because she's lying about concrete things. She's not distorting this. She's lying directly when she says, Stella is older than I, just slightly. And that's when she says, to Mitch, put the colored paper lantern 
over the light bulb. And so that metaphorically is what she's doing with this identity that she's constructing for Mitch. You know, my name means an orchard in spring. Well, not really. Um, we're French by extraction, so we're French. Well, maybe not. Um, she's older than I am. All of these are pieces to this lantern that are covering the the horror of the reality that doesn't coincide with what she what she wants, what she wants her you know what what she wants her identity to be and what she wants her place in the world to be. And so she says, I can't stand a naked light bulb any more than I can a rude remark or a vulgar action. Well, actually, you know, she says this, but she's quite vulgar, isn't she? She's quite rude. She said um, about the, the wives of the women, uh, the, the wives of the men playing poker, that they must be beefy. That's quite rude. And so she herself is, is actually trying to romanticize her own actions and her own identity as well, because it's clearly not the case. She can be quite rude and she can be quite vulgar. Um, okay, and so we move on and we've got this conversation between Mitch and Blanche and then Stanley bellows, Mitch, coming. And so it could be because he's actually jealous. It could be because um, Mitch and, and uh, Blanche are actually having a conversation that he wouldn't mind having access to Blanche um, because of the... I suppose the power struggle more than the sexual tension, but the sexual tension is part of that power struggle. Um, and then, you know, we have this music again, Blanche waltzing to the music with romantic gestures. Mitch is delighted and then moves in awkward imitation like a dancing bear. And that's exactly the dynamic that Blanche likes, this admiration. She is superior, the others are support, subordinate. She's capable and articulate and Mitch is like a bear. And so that's the dynamic that she really likes. Um, but it's interesting because in terms of a marriage, that's probably not actually what would make her happy. And so we have this, this desire, this need, this hunger for admiration and almost limitless, um, adoration. Yet at the same time, there's something inside her that recognizing, recognizes that that's probably what, not what she needs. So in terms of sexual attraction, Stanley is much more what she's sexually attracted to. So there's a sort of hypocrisy but also a schizophrenia in that in that as well isn't there um okay and then we've got this lunacy lunacy um stanley charges after stella and he hits her this has been building up the tension towards this has been building up throughout the scene because stanley is frustrated about blanche he's frustrated with the poker game and he ends up hitting stella directly although it's off it's outside of the frame of the play itself, we hear it. Stella cries, Blanche screams, and runs into the kitchen. And here we can see that Stanley is not a misunderstood class warrior. He is actually a violent wife beater. And so, lest there be any doubt, you know, it, it's possible that the first two scenes, we could see that maybe Stanley is just a bit rough, a bit rude, a bit vulgar but he's got drive, he's got ambition. Here we can actually see that he's very violent and has no problem whatsoever in hitting his pregnant wife. And so I think, I suppose Williams is doing that just to make it absolutely clear what Stanley is capable of doing. And so that we don't, as an audience, romanticize him as well, because there is, the, you know, there's the, the possibility of doing that. Um, okay, and so we've got Blanche saying lunacy, absolute lunacy, Stanley is forced into the bedroom and he, I think they throw him in the shower, don't they? Um, Blanche and Stella go off. Stanley says, what's the matter? What's happened? Although we wonder if that's actually, you know, Stan Stanley seems quite on the ball. It's possible that he did know what happened. Um, and again, there's a sort of denial there in that question. What happened? There's a denial in the question, uh, which is similar to a certain extent to, to Blanche's denial about the things that she's done or convenient forgetting, let's say. Um, you know, so they get him coffee and they stick him in the shower. And um, then we have this Stanley remorseful breaking into sobs. His conscience, my baby doll's left me. He dials her, he speaks to her and Stella can't control herself. She can't resist him. Um, his display, his dramatic display of um, remorse convinces her that he really loves her and she can't resist. And so she goes, she goes downstairs 
when he's screaming with heaven splitting violence, Stella! Um, and she goes. Blanche ends up with Mitch. And again, Blanche says, I'm terrified. You know, she stays with Mitch and she's sort of using the situation to, to reel Mitch in a little bit closer. And again, she probably is concerned for Stella, but she is more concerned for herself and using the situation to, to allow Mitch to console her and comfort her and reassure her, which for her is, is the default, I suppose. Um, and Mitch says, there's nothing to be scared of. They're crazy about each other. And Blanche says, oh, I'm not used to such. And she goes back to her delicate dialogue where she uses pauses to, to imply things, uh, which is very similar to what happened in the first scene. So we've seen the way that Blanche's dialogue actually changes, the way that she uses language. It's gone from being sort of all euphemistic and you know all delicate and unable to say things that are just too unpleasant into the, the part where she's speaking to Stella and saying, you know, what does Mitch do? Uh, where does he live? who is he very direct very demanding and then we've gone back to the way that she speaks to men which again is very um she uses pauses to disguise the nasty things that she's just too feminine and delicate to say and so this is how this is how this scene ends um you know and she's gone back to her default which is oh i'm not properly dressed mitch says it doesn't make any difference in the quarter and she says, there's so much, so much confusion in the world. Thank you for being so kind. I need kindness now. And again, it's about her. You know, her, her sister has effectively just been beaten up by her abusive husband. And the scene ends with Blanche kind of fluttering around again in order to go back into that default mode that she has in order to, to, to be able to cope with things when they're not romanticized and so she in fact herself is romanticizing the events that have just happened so that they turn around her i need kindness now there's no mention of what stella needs and so that scene is really really important in terms of setting up the dynamic clarifying that stanley is incredibly violent and that he's capable of of really horrific violence um the way that that um Stella, I think, is pulled into that, pulled into his orbit in the same way to a certain degree that Mitch is pulled into Blanche's orbit, um, that they kind of can't resist it because both Blanche and Stanley are very, very good at getting what they want. They do it in different ways, but they're very, very good at it. We're also shown that this world of New Orleans is not really romantic it's you, you, we, we as an audience can't romanticize it we can't romanticize stanley we can't really romanticize blanche we can't romanticize stella and stanley's relationship as being you know full of passion but you know a little bit vulgar and a little bit you know difficult but full of passion he, he you know he's beaten up his pregnant wife we can't romanticize blanche that much because we know just how focused she is on getting what she wants as well and so this is a really, really important scene for all of those different reasons. This idea of light, light exposing and light being manipulated to portray a projection that, that um, Blanche wants to portray as well. And we almost feel sorry for Mitch, don't we? We feel like he's almost like a lamb to the slaughter because Blanche is so effective and so good at getting what she wants. So this is a really, really key scene. And I think Williams needs to, needs to create it that way Again, so that we as an audience don't over romanticize things and don't um, don't put Stanley against Stella as one good and one bad or one vulnerable and the other strong. There, there is a little bit of the predatory in both of them and that comes out particularly strongly in this scene in the way that it finishes. Okay, so that is the end of scene two. All right, I hope that was useful, guys.